Um, hello, okay, I think we're good. So, um, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm uh, Remy Denis Cormont, and I'm, as JB, I'm, uh, I've been involved for way too long in the Videoland project. And uh, I'm going to talk about, well, mostly the Linux side of things. Um, and um, since this is a multimedia and music uh, conference, uh, it's going to be mostly about output. Well, that's the official reason. The real reason is that I've mostly been working on outputs. Um, although, if you remember the site reading talk from this morning, I actually did the MIDI support in VLC, and that's more like an input thing, but I haven't done most, most of the input stuff. So, um, so basically, it's audio and video, which is kind of like what JB does, talked about, but on uh, Linux, this is Linux conference after all. Um, so just a warning, uh, this is my personal opinion. It has nothing to do with my employer. I happen to work for a well, graphics chipset manufacturer with a green logo. I'm not going to ne give any names. Um, and if I speak too fast or do not articulate, please stop me. Uh, you can also stop me if you didn't understand the word or whatever. Um, I think we have time. So um, multimedia pipeline, um, well, as JB kind of touched already in the previous presentation, it's um, pretty much the same in every uh, multimedia framework. It's the same in GIST framework, it's the same in Direct Show. Um, it's kind of similar on Android. Even, even in player, while being monolithic, has a similar uh, work split between the different components. And this simply comes from the fact that the specifications um, that we have to implement are the same for everybody, and they kind of to split. The way, the, way you, the way everybody splits. So usually the input side, you have a byte stream reader. Now the naming uh, nomenclature might be different from project to project, but, but it's pretty much always the same thing. So you have a URL or a file pass, and, and out of that you have a component that will like, implement HTTP, file access, FTP, whatever. Then you have your file format parser. Um, and uh, so far it's pretty much like any software, like even OpenOffice would work that way. But, of course, uh, the format parser is focused on uh, multimedia, so it's mostly about extracting audio and video signals from, from a file. So they are usually multiplexed together in a single file, and you have to uh, extract them and also extract uh, m metadata like resolution, codecs, and the timing information. You might have packetizers, um, which, especially for audio, is used to... Um, well, if, if your file format doesn't preserve packet boundaries, then you might need to regenerate them from the bitstream. But usually the format, the file format takes care of that, so you don't need to do this. And the parentheses. And then you have the decoders. So you have audio decoders, video decoders, and uh, subtitle decoders. Or font renderers, or whatever you want to call them. And then you have what I would call outputs, so filters. Um, the interlacing, um, gamma correction, whatever. Blending and overlays is where you put the subtitles back into the video signal, and then your output, audio and video. And the pipeline is driven by, well, buffer levels, write control, drift compensation, lip sync, which is all time-based. And that's basically the main difference between uh, multimedia and the other similar, well, other desktop application in that we drive everything on time, and we don't load the whole file. We just play it as, it, as time goes, because, I mean, typical video might be gigabytes big, you just don't want to decode the whole thing in, in memory. It could be terabytes after decoding anyway. So um, focusing, uh, as Stock said, on audio and video output. So audio. Turns out that it's not, what you need to do is not that complicated, but it's surprising uh, how, um, how bad uh, media audio output APIs are, including on Linux. Um, so one problem with multimedia is that um, we have what I would call audibly long buffers. And by that, I simply mean that the length, the duration of the buffer that we typically have is something that you will notice, um, that a human will notice if you hear it. Um, and it, that's very different from what you would have in games or in real-time communications where you want to minimize delay because it's interactive. I mean, it wouldn't do if you're, if you're first-person shooter, you pressed shoot, and one second later, it actually shoots, and you hear the shooting sound. Um, for multimedia, you usually do want to have buffers, and uh, that's because it avoids, um, well, it reduces stuttering, uh, especially if you have uh, scheduling latencies due to some other application taking some CPU time. And it also reduces uh, power consumption because the uh, larger your audio blocks are, so audio periods are, the fewer interrupts you get from the audio chip, 
and so the lower your power consumption is. Or CPU processing as well. So unlike games and, and um, well, user button sounds, you have, uh, we need some uh, special, well, we need proper support for handling uh, long latencies in our audio pipeline. And, and that's, that's a problem because a lot of uh, audio APIs have been driven by uh, either game developers or, or um, UI developers and not necessarily been taking into account the specific requirements of, of multimedia. And by that, it's not just DLC. I mean, the same would apply to GStreamer, to uh, other frameworks that you might find on Linux. So, for, so the requirements we have for buffers are relatively simple. Um, we need to be able to maintain limb synchronization, so we need to keep the audio and the video rendered at the same time, otherwise it's really annoying. Um, and so for that, we need to have an estimate from the API what's the uh, time difference between the time we actually send the audio block to the API and the time it's actually going to be coming out of your speakers, which, as I was saying, is, is audibly long. Typically, we're talking about a few hundred milliseconds, even, even up to two seconds with some... Um, high-end chips, like, well, high-end desktop, desktop chips. Um, and uh, you need to be able to control your fill, your fill levels, so um, you don't want to have too little PCM samples in the buffer, otherwise you might stutter. But on the other hand, if you, are, if you are finishing the playback, like you are at the end of your music, you are at the end of your video, you want to make sure that the last second is going to be played, it's not going to be dropped because you happen to well, it, it was in the buffer, and, and then you have your buffer duration, say, one second, and then you just close, and, oh, well, your last second of audio is just going to go and dropped. Um, it's, it's not such a big problem for long movies, because usually the last second is silent, but it's really annoying for, say, music, for instance, where usually the last second has some noise. And then you have uh, user interaction requirements. So um, if the user press stops or just exits a player, we need to flush, and by that I mean we actually need to drop any pending audio immediately. to stop straight away. Similarly, if the user press the pause and resume button, you want, even so you have maybe, well, you have some samples in the buffer, you want to be able to stop playback as soon as possible, like a few milliseconds delay, which is going to be a lot shorter time than what your buffer length actually is. And so it just wouldn't do to wait for the buffer to empty itself normally, because if you do that, then user presses pause, and then you have half a second or one second of audio going on, and then it actually pauses, and when, when you press resume, it waits for one second before it actually resumes. That's a really bad experience. Um, and of course, you also want volume and mute control to be uh, interactive, because it's really bad for the user feedback. If, if like, you increase the volume and it takes one second before it actually increases, it's, like, you know, it's kind of like tuning your shower for hot and, and cold. Like, if, if it takes too long, then it always ends up being too hot, and then well, if it's audio volume, it's like it ends up being too loud. And then it stays too loud for one second, and then it's a good. So it, no. But more specifically, with volume control, what we actually need is um, is is to have a control on the stream that we are playing, because typically, on a, especially on a computer, but also true on a mobile device, you have multiple audio sources that might be mixed. So on a mobile device, it might be your ringtone or or your SMS tone. On on a, on a computer, it will be uh, email notification, or it might be game or whatever. We don't want to interfere with the volume level of other applications. And uh, that's something that doesn't always work. And then you have things that I would argue are obvious, but it um, seems that for some developers they are not. Um, so we need to be able to enumerate devices. We need to have hot plug. Um, yeah, back in the days when, when audio computer started, maybe 20 years ago, when you had your audio sound blaster card in, in your in your desktop PCs, and you just had one, and, and you set it up at boot, and if you change something, God forbid, you just reboot the computer. But nowadays, you have like hot, you have what headsets, wireless headsets, USB sticks. You might have the HDMI cable which you plug in and out, and which is an audio device in a way. So you need to have a hot plug. Um, by that, I mean you need the application needs to be able to get events when there's a device coming and when there's a device going. And of course, you need to be able to negotiate um, your buffering parameters, your format parameters. So are you outputting 16 bits integers? Are you doing floating point output? Which, which rates, which sample rate are you using? Which channel are you setting? So stereo, monophonic, 5.1, 7.1, so on. And it turns out that there's a lot of problems. Um, 
So there's a number of APIs for audio output who confuse total latency, which is the real latency that you will experience between the time you actually submit an audio block and the time it actually starts to, be, to get rendered. They might confuse that with the actual size of the buffer, i.e. the addressable buffer. But usually there is always some part of the buffer that is no longer addressable because it's already somewhere in the circuitry, in the electronics, and, and you can't just undo it. So that, that's been a problem, and the reason for that is just that historically this was not an issue. There was no such thing as non-addressable buffers, but, but hardware has moved on, and, and, and now this is a problem. You might have no support for pause resume, so you end up or delay when you pause and resume. You might not have flush, which uh, means that your stop is going to take a while, and that's really, well, that's annoying. Volume controls might be for the whole device. And what's, that I was saying already, there are other issues. Your configuration might not work properly. So there's a lot of APIs who won't tell you what channels are available. Um, or you can't state what channels you have. Like you only say, I have six channels. I have three channels. Now if you have three channels, is it 3.0 or is it 2.1? Well, you don't know. If you don't have explicit layout, you can't say. And device management is also often broken. So no events or, or just the list of devices doesn't make any sense. Is anyone using Jack? Raise your hand here. Okay, that's not many. I would have thought such a conference would have more, but anyway. So um, Jack is, is nice, but it's really specific. Um, it, it's, it's really targeted at low latency playback, so it, it, it has manual routing, so you just have a UI for Jack where you will say, okay, this software, like this VLC media player, it's routed this way through these filters, and then it goes to this output. And it always uses a single position floating point output, so no digital pass through, like a speed diff. And what it effectively does is that it works around all of the requirements. It doesn't actually address the requirements because it, it avoids them altogether. It, since it's always all latency, you don't have the latency problem, which is the main problem. And you also don't have device enumeration problem because everything is manually done post um, media player. But the problem, of course, Jack is it's not really adequate for general use. It's too complicated. So what a lot of people use on Linux is Alza, of course, which is a low-level API, and also a mid-level, uh, mid-layer of what? Middleware kind of API, which is you have both uh, Alza at the kernel level, and then you have uh, the Alza, the Asan library, which provides both uh, direct access to the uh, kernel API and also a bunch of uh, extra convenience functions on top of it. Um, and it, you'd think, uh, since the guys are running it, I actually have a clue, and it's been in Linux since quite a, quite a long time now. It came in 2.5, and it was already being developed uh, as a patch in Canon 2.4. There's still a bunch of problems. Um, hardware capabilities especially are annoying, because all that states, being a device driver API originally, it basically tells you what, the, what your audio chip can do, but it doesn't tell you what it can actually do because you might have, I mean, if you have a desktop, for instance, you typically have 5.1 or 7.1 uh, audio card. And if you look at the back of your computer, you'll have like the four or five um, connectors, jacks. Just because you have five jacks doesn't mean you have five sets of speakers. Um, typically, you only have stereo. And there's no way to know that from Alza. I tell you, yeah, sure, I can play six channels. Yeah, I can play eight channels, except you can't because only the first two ones are actually going to make any sound or any noise. Um, and there's this plug or plug hardware plugin which is doing a um, conversion on the fly for stuff that the hardware can't do. Um, now, if you, if you ask it, can I do six channels or eight channels, it says sure, and it just drops everything that your, uh, your hardware doesn't do. So it doesn't tell you that, no, uh, well, it doesn't tell you that it drops it, and there's no way to know that it's going to drop it. So it's not very usable. So recently, they added uh, support for channel maps, which is a way you can explicitly negotiate um, which, um, which channels you have. So left, right, middle, LFE, um, back right, back left, whatever. And I think that, that I guess that comes from uh, GMR requirements. Unfortunately, it's a recent addition, and not all drivers support it yet. And uh, again, just like uh, for channel count, it, it's, it tells you what uh, the hardware has. It doesn't tell you what actually is wired. So it, if you have a 7.1 card, it's going to give you all the eight 7.1 channels, but it's not going to tell you which one's actually wired to anything. Even so, nowadays, hardware usually has jack detect. 
uh, there's no way to there's no easy way to use it in Alza. So in practice, all, all, all software with Alza output they just default to, to stereo, and you have to go to some application specific setting somewhere to change that. So in DLC we have in the Alza plugin configuration, yeah, like I have stereo, and I have 5.1, I have 7.1, and every other application has to reinvent it. And the similar issue for digital output, so um, SPDIF. It, it can tell you that your chip supports SPDIF, but it's not going to tell you if you actually have a digital uh, output connected. So you have to disable it by default and wait for the user to en enable it explicitly. And perhaps what's annoying me most is that there's just no stream volume. And even, even actual volume control for the whole hardware are a complete mess in Alza, because um, they just don't really abstract anything. So they just give you all the different controls that your low-level hardware has without any kind of usable abstraction that software could, uh, that, that software could use, um, which would be basically like a main volume and then a stream volume. Um, and what's also annoying is device management is kind of missing. Uh, you can enumerate devices, but you cannot get events when there's a change in a set of device. In, in theory, you could do that, uh, at least for um, devices that have a device driver, you could use UDEV, except it doesn't really work, because when UDEV tells you, hey, I have a new audio device, it turns out that there's some post-processing that Alza needs to do before the device actually works, and there's no way to know when that is done, so if you just try to use the device right away, it just fails. And another issue with uh, device management is um, that what, what Alza calls a device is actually a speaker configuration. So you have, if you have one audio card, it's going to tell you, you have this audio card with 5.1, this audio card with 6.7.1. That's just not the way people think of their audio output. I mean, what you would want to have is, okay, I have the internal audio output, I have the HDMI output, I have my headset. Unfortunately, that's not what, uh, what Alza provides. So in practice, uh, Alza is not really good for um, high-level application usage. There's also OSS, still exists. Um, there's some uh, people who I think like, kind of like Clue, but they think that, seem to think that open system is uh, better than Alza. I don't know why. Because the uh, OSS has a very questionable API. It's based on RUCTL. There's no way to abstract anything. Everything has to be done in kernel, including format, config, format uh, conversions and floating. I mean, doing floating point in kernel is a bad idea since there's no, uh, typically there's no support for that in hardware or in the chipset processor. But, uh, well, to be fair, most of the outstanding issues that uh, version 3 had, the version that was last in the kernel, are gone in version 4. Uh, I think what is good news is that the OSS seems to be dead since there's not been any real update since uh, for the last five years, almost. So it looks like we might be able to get rid of it except on FreeBSD, where it's still the official API. SNDIO is uh, the OSS replacement from uh, op OpenBSD. It's really nothing but not inventing your syndrome. Um, it makes each and every possible mistake that you can make when designing an audio API. So all of the ones I gave earlier, except for one, it's, it has per stream audio volume. But it doesn't have buffers, it doesn't have channel negotiation, it doesn't have pause, it, it doesn't have anything. Um, it's like the open basic guys, they wanted to remove OSS and they replaced it with something that was effectively worse in every possible respect, almost. It's also been used on Linux by this server, which is some kind of Pulse Audio or MP competitor, which they decided for some idiotic reason to use SNDIO. Um, don't ask me. Luckily, that project is also mostly dead. Uh, but there are people asking for this. So Pulse Audio, that's a more modern thing. Oh, it's not so recent anymore, but um, no, that's actually quite good. And it's uh, quite well documented. Now, if you've read the Alza documentation, it's horrible. Um, they will have Alza get foobar. It tells you, OK, this is to get your foobar stuff. It's not very really helpful. Alza has some decent documentation. Unfortunately, uh, when uh, Lennart gave up on that project to move to systemd, he didn't, in my opinion, uh, hand over the maintenance very well, and so there's been a bunch of maintenance problems and bug scoping. So overall, basically, unless you are specific use cases like low latency where you want to use Jack or embedded where you have to use Alza, then I think Pulse Audio is the only option. So video, well, as Zigbee was mentioning, we need to have uh, YUV support, we need to have subsampling, so 420, 422, where you have less information on colors and on uh, light 
uh, coming right uh, now this year mostly is also is a 10 bit support so where you have 10 bits per component rather than just eight which would mean you would have one billion colors rather than uh, well, whatever uh, rather than 16 million in terms of planar picture format um, we need to have scaling in hardware we need to have blending in hardware because it's kind of silly to do that in uh, in cpu and then the goodies are filtering the interesting gamma correction resolution blah 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 so on X11, there's different ways to do, realistically, to do a video rendering. You can just use plain X, but then you have to do scaling in CPU. You have to do color conversion in CPU. X video, GLX render video, blah, blah, blah. OK, I'm going to go through them later anyway. So GLX is basically OpenGL. Render is um, a scaling, and then the last ones are accelerated. Um, Wayland, um, so the supposed X11 replacement, it doesn't really have a replacement for X-Video and VDPIU, but other than that, you find a mostly equivalent thing. So uh, it has EGL for, except instead of GLX, and then it has a scaler, which corresponds roughly to uh, X-Render. So the X-Video extension is how media players have mostly been uh, rendering video for the last uh, 10 years, 15 years. And it was meant for hardware, with, um, but it was designed in the, in the time when graphic cards had a dedicated overlay for video rendering, as they don't do that anymore. And fortunately, um, because hardware really was done that way, it didn't, didn't support compositing and blending, so you couldn't add subtitles. And uh, the API was never fixed to address the fact that we didn't have the hardware um, limitations anymore. Cropping is not very consistent across, uh, across drivers. Uh, it's most, nowadays, it's just a backward compatibility, backward compatibility API that the X server provides you, or the, actually the, drive, the X driver provides. So yeah, I think it's uh, it's long view for dropping support for it. Render, not render, sorry about the typo. Um, yeah, well, it's um, it supports only RGB, but other than that, it's usable, except sometimes it's really slow, depending on your uh, driver. DRM is a low-level API provided by the kernel directly. Unfortunately, it's um, not provided by proprietary drivers, like the one made by my employer. Um, and um, so it's mostly intended as a interface or middleware APIs like GL and video acceleration. It's not meant to be used by applications like, oh, it's not meant to be used by application in the sense that VLC or GStreamer would be applications. And so last are VDPU and VDVA, if they were originally mostly meant as a hardware, hardware decoding acceleration, not so much rendering APIs, but, um, but that's what we have. Um, unfortunately, there's no agreement on which one to use. So uh, AMD and NVIDIA are using VDPAU which is an OG, originally an uh, NVIDIA API. Intel is pushing its own VA, which, which came later, but uh, as more popular among open source activists because it had open source code from the ground, from the start. XVBA was the old AMD API, nobody uses it anymore. Uh, problem, well, those APIs work fine, but except for the fact that they are not vendor neutral. They are currently lacking IDEF, so 10 bits, but I guess this is coming real soon, but I don't, don't know yet. OpenGL is basically what everybody's using nowadays. The problem is that it's a hell of different versions. So you have 1.0, 1.1, blah, 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 2.0, 2.1, 3.0, and now 4. And 5 is coming next, uh, this year with all kind of extensions. So dealing with all kind of different hardware limitations can be, is, is get the, the code gets really complicated. But in practice, um, on Linux, this is the best option we have nowadays. And it's interoperable with uh, VDPAU and VA for if you want to have hardware acceleration in front of it. You can still use OpenGL at the back. So in practice, you're just using either VDPIU or OpenGL. But then you have driver bugs, but hey, you have, that's it. Yes, uh, just waiting. Sorry. Everybody's sleeping? Oh, well, well, uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for that. Excellent. Uh, 